So Gabi, today's talk is about proximal and invertible neural networks. Please. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice introduction and thank you all for inviting me to your seminar. And since the seminar is Malaga seminar series, I think I should uh, speak about MAL, that means the machine learning. So I, I took the talk about uh, proximal and invertible neural networks, and this is basically joint work with some of my PhD students and postdocs in alphabetical order. It's Paul Hagemann, Johannes Hertrich, and Sebastian Neumeyer, who is already a postdoc. And there are some other authors which will appear during my talk. So what I will speak about, the first part will be about so-called proximal. You can understand me very well, yes, yeah? Yes. Okay. So in the first part of my talk, I will speak about proximal neural networks and the motivation for this proximal neural networks comes from the wish that we want to have neural networks with a controlled Lipschitz constant. And of course, there was also another, was another motivation for this work, and this was the motivation um, Filippo has already touched, namely, if you have a hammer, you consider everything as a nail, and one one background of me is um, harmonic analysis and also a convex analysis. And as many people are doing this time, they want to find a relation between the fields they know and this emerging field of data science and in particular neural networks. So I want to find a relation to my former life. So to say it shortly. So, okay. And then uh, I have several points here, how to do this. And then there is a second uh, part in my talk. This is about invertible neural networks. And the motivation for this invertible neural networks comes from the fact that we want to sample from posterior distributions, like you know it, for example, in GANs, but maybe you know also these invertible neural networks. So let me start with these proximal neural networks. Okay, first part, let us introduce proximal neural networks. And as I said, it has to do with convex analysis. And what I want to do is to introduce networks which are so-called averaged operators. So you can see my mouse, yes, no? I built networks which are average operators. So what's an average operator? We are given the cone of proper convex lower semi-continuous function, which I will denote in the following by gamma zero. Then an operator from RD in RD is called T averaged for some parameter T if it is the convex combination of a non-expensive operator and the identity operator. You can define such averaged operators also in Hilbert spaces more general and indeed in our papers we did it for general infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, but I will skip this in this talk. And you can do also something here if you go to Banach spaces, but then it becomes curious. So, okay, let's have a look at these average operators. They have many interesting properties. One property is if you concatenate such average operators, also average, and then you use the result and then take the next average operator, it's again an average operator. So the concatenation of average operators is averaged. Second, and this goes into the direction I want, namely Lipschitz constants, Average operators are one Lipschitz continuous, but this means that the Lipschitz constant is smaller or equal to one. And of course, if you want to apply, for example, Banach's fixed point theorem, you need smaller than one. So it's a little bit more than you can have in Banach's fixed point theorem. The good thing with these average operators is that if you uh, set up a fixed point iteration starting with some x0 and this operator t has a fixed point, then the series converges to a fixed point. And the difference to the Banach's fixed point theorem is that you can have many fixed points and it depends on the starting point to which fixed point this series converges. Yeah, But nevertheless, you have a convergence guarantee. So and how fast this fixed point iteration converges depends on this t here. And the best t is in general the t which is near to one half because you see it's somehow symmetric here t and one minus t. So t equal to one half is normally the guy who, is, um, who gives the best convergence in this fixed point iteration. So and here uh, there is one class of operators, which is one half average. And these are, also there are many of them, but one class are so-called proximal operators. And this is where the name of our networks finally comes from. So let me go to these 
proximal operators. So what is the proximal operator? This is a specific thing in convex analysis. People have used this during the last year in many variation of formulations in image processing. It's the following. Given a function f, a proximal operator is just the minimizer of f of y, but then you add something which is regularizing here, namely the norm of x minus y. And the special thing we need in our talk is that here we have not just the Euclidean norm in RD or some norm in Hilbert space. We need a special norm here, namely the norm with respect to an operator t. And this T is a linear operator, but it can be rectangular. It can be this matrix, as in RD, it's just the matrix, can have more rows than columns or in the uh, converse direction. So, and then we need this norm is then a very special norm. The operator can have a zero space or a null space, but if you put the norm in this fashion here, then it's indeed a norm on RD. And then RD together with this norms becomes of, uh, an inner product space. So. Okay, and you have one uh, special thing, namely if the matrix T transpose times T is the identity or the converse T times T transpose is the identity, you must think about rectangular matrices with uh, orthogonal rows or columns, then this norm is just the two norm, yeah, it's again the Euclidean norm. This also happens if T is just the multiple of, uh, of an of an identity <laughs> operator. So this is a proximity operator. So and this has many, many nice properties. I don't want to go into the detail. I was, uh, but there is a very interesting theorem and this theorem relates everything with networks. Namely, it says the following. If you have such a matrix here and uh, then you apply it and you'd have a B, this is just an affine transform. Then you apply the proximum, but here's a proximum with respect to the identity operator. Yeah, the usual proximum without this T. And then you apply the more Penrose inverse to this again. Then this is again a proximal operator. Yeah, it's again a usual proximal operator, but with respect to another norm. So, and um, yeah, and I will maybe I first explain you what this has to do with networks that you stay in the talk. And, and then I explain a little bit more where this is coming from. And you see here some new author, authors came into the play. And this, this has a reason. So, okay, but first let me tell you what this will have to do with your networks. Namely, it can be shown, and indeed this was shown in papers of Combet and Pisquet, and the, area, the idea of these networks indeed goes back to these authors, but they never computed something. And um, this, they showed that most of the activation functions which are used in neural networks are indeed proximal operators with respect to the identity matrix here. Yeah? And I can show you something here. This is just a list. Uh, maybe I have to make it all. It's not so good to see. You cannot see it really nice. So now you can see it. It's just from our paper, a screenshot. For example, if you want a, as an activation function, and this is more in direction of harmonic analysis, soft thresholding, which appears in, in wavelet theory. And indeed, the original idea for the theory can, came from wavelet theory. Then this can be an activation function. And this is indeed a proximum. This is known. This is just the soft thresholding function is just the proximum of the absolute value function. But also other functions, also this is more usual in wavelet theory, the soft thresholding. But other functions which are more which you use in um, networks, for example, um, ReLU, where is ReLU? Here is ReLU. It also comes from some proximal function f. I have to say f can be a function which can also take the value plus infinity. No? And here are all these functions which appear in neural networks and all these functions are proximal functions. So, and um, this, and it can be shown that such proximum is uh, in a stable activation function. If the sigma has some properties, it must be monotone increasing, one Lipschitz, and sigma at zero, this activation function must be zero. And whenever you have these three properties, it's a proximum, okay? So let me go back and tell you why the other authors come into the play. 
So I already said that a special proximum is soft shrinkage. And here my co-author Marcy Hessen has up come into the play because she's working in harmonic analysis and Filippo knows her very well. Um, and um, then it has to do it, it originally comes from harmonic analysis to deal with these things. So Simon sets, uh, has some contributions. He was a former PhD student of mine. And then there was Galen Plonker. And indeed the theorem comes from a paper of Galen. And, but in her paper, I had a look at this paper, she has forgotten this operator T here. And then I had a look into this paper and was saying, okay, she proves 30 pages of something, but it must be wrong. And indeed without this operator, it's, it's really wrong, but she doesn't meant this without these operators, but I go. So, and now I have to show you why this here, this, this, this unit here, this is something which appears in neural networks here, no, with this, because prox is, a, is just an activation function. Why is this a proximum with an operator T. So, and this goes back to uh, also why this claim is fine and why we need this operator. And this is, uh, was for me a nice exercise in analysis, namely there is a result of Moreau, a very old result, and Moreau characterizes in convex analysis what are the proximal operators between Hilbert spaces in general. And uh, he said, okay, and this is proved that something is a proximal operator if it is non-expensive, but you must be really careful, non-expensive with respect to what norm. Yeah, and here we have this T norm. So, and the second thing, and this is even harder, non-expensive was not the problem with Galen's formulation, but this here, a proximal operator, yeah, and uh, this is here, also with T and our, and without T, was it for her? And this is indeed a proximal operator if it is the gradient of a function. That means a proximal operator is a conservative vector field. And then I have learned, and I teach it to engineers, if you have a conservative vector field, a vector field which comes from a potential, then it must have rotation zero, or the Hessian of the sky must be symmetric. And this wasn't if you have this T here. So, so I, we were really thinking about what does it mean if you have now such a vector space R to the power of also RD together with the special T norm. What does it mean, the gradient? What is wrong? Why it is not symmetric if I compute the gradient as I normally do it for a function? Yeah, I can compute the gradient of some function and then have a look if this is symmetric or not. So, and then it comes out the following you must go back how the gradient is defined. That's why I say it's an exercise in analysis. Namely, you can, you can uh, what is well defined is the Frechet derivative of some function. And this Frechet derivative is just this linear operator here, everybody knows it, which can be applied to some function in your space. And then you have a small o and this norm here depends of course on the norm which you, which you choose in your Hilbert space. So now we are in RD and in RD and you, if you choose some norm, all norms are equivalent. So the Frechet derivative doesn't depend at all on the norm you take. If you take the T norm or another norm, it's the Frechet derivative is Frechet derivative, independent of your norm. But of course the gradient, the gradient is defined in such a way, it's the inner product of, um, of with some H and that must hold true for all H. And then here on the right hand side, you have the Frechet derivative. So the message is that the gradient, of course, because you have this inner product here, this inner product is related to your T norm. Yeah, it's the inner product which is related to this T norm. And the gradient crucially, de crucially depends on the chosen space or on the norm of the space. So if you do this computation carefully, you, you see it's really symmetric, but you have to be really careful about the norm here. And this was a good thing for me because I was really frustrated uh, what's wrong with all these things, but it really depends on which on the norm you take in RD, this uh, theorem of Moreau. Good, okay, but okay, this was just a small excursion and why I found it quite interesting to have a look at this theory. So, okay, and now the idea is, okay, let's take proximal neural network. That means we take networks now consisting of such blocks and each block is just such an operator as I had it before. Here was uh, the, um, the um, more Penrose inverse, but of course I don't want proximal operators where each proximal operator is defined with respect to another Hilbert space. 
I want the same Hilbert space. And that's why I now come back to what I had at the previous slide that I have the same Hilbert space. Oh, I make to click here. I have the same Hilbert space here if I take just such orthogonal matrices or multiples of orthogonal matrices, then I came up here with the same Hilbert space. And that's why I go now from my more penrose inverse to just the transpose, okay? So these are just rectangular matrices in one or the other direction, uh, which um, which form uh, some, uh, well, if you multiply them, you get the identity. Or with other words, the matrices or the matrices transposed belong to a sh compact Stiefel manifold. Yeah, this is the same. So, and I want to consider such networks. So, and if you have a look at them, they are quite, look quite similar as usual networks. The only thing is, uh, here should be a B1. Uh, that you have your orthogonal matrices and you have these two matrices which come to each other. Yeah, And this is a little bit more than just saying that in the middle here, there should be a one orthogonal matrix. It's a little bit more, there is a remark in our paper which shows this. So you have now ne networks consisting of these parts. So, yeah, but all these blocks here, which you have here, all these parts are now proximal operators, as, as we know from our theory. So, and since they are in the concatenation in particular, they are average operators with this constant one half. So, and if I, if you concatenate them, it's still an average operator. So, it's clear that this network now is an average operator, which means that it has uh, Lipschitz constants which is smaller or equal than one. So, and these are our special networks here. So now comes um, more or less a drawback of these things, namely how can we learn such networks? Normally you can learn it uh, by, yeah, okay, by minimizing some cost function. And of course we uh, do the same. We take just the, two, uh, the square the Euclidean norm as a cost function here, but uh, we can use any other norm that's not the bottleneck of the, of the thing. And here is our cost function now, our functional, which we have to minimize with respect to this uh, to this parameters u. And in the parameters u, you have the b. Okay, as the activation function, you can take what you want. Maybe um, you can suppose that it's differentiable, either so ReLU or smooth ReLU should be good. Uh, and But here is also in this u are also uh, my matrices T and they are orthogonal. So what you have really to do if you minimize this, you cannot just use the usual algorithm. You must use a stochastic gradient distant algorithm on the Stiefel manifold. And this is a little bit more involved. And I have cited here just uh, the book of Absel and, uh, and co-workers on optimization on matrix manifolds. But nevertheless, you can do this or better Johannes Herdrich did it. So so, okay, also you use a stochastic gradient descent algorithm on the Stiefel manifold, which takes a little bit more time than just uh, minimizing or learning usual networks, yeah? So, okay, or there's also an alternative to this stochastic gradient descent algorithm, which is now on a, on a manifold. Um, namely, you can use a so-called inertial and stochastic version of the so-called PALM algorithm. What means PALM? This is proximal alternating linearized minimal algorithm. And this PALM algorithm is very well suited for non-convex problems. So, and we did it in a stochastic version and also in an inertial version. And this is based on a variance reduced gradient estimator. And we can also show that these algorithms here, this is this paper here, inertial stochastic climate applications in machine learning. And we can show that under some assumptions, there is linear convergence of this algorithm. This is mathematically harder. It's mathematically more involved and it's under review for a long time now. So, okay, but nevertheless, we also have an algorithm where we can show convergence somehow. And it's, uh, it's nicely because it comes really, it involves a lot of stochastics. So, okay. Now a little bit about the numerical results. I don't want to show my results here, but on the next slide, there will follow some uh, for some reasons, I will tell you. Okay, what we did in this very first paper, which was indeed a paper, uh, Filippo, in the Journal of, of Fouille Analysis. Yeah, so uh, a paper which comes from Lily Harmonic Analysis. And we compared it to denoising algorithm with wave flat Parseval frames, with half frames or whatever. And surprise, surprise, 
our network was better than these algorithms. Okay. And then we did something which uh, really ref us that we have a good Lipschitz constant, namely we took this uh, MNIST data set, which is a very simple data set, as you know, for classification. And then we put an adversarial attack, attack on this data net. And yes, our many, and then this adversarial attacks are in particular very bad if you have a neural network with a large Lipschitz constant, but our Lipschitz constant is one. And we can really, could really show that it works better with respect to adversarial attacks so that it's robust against adversarial attacks. So I don't want to show these 99% or whatever it get in, in as a classification rate because it's a simple example. And this was also something to see that it basically works. So what I mean with basically works, so far we have learned a, a network uh, with fully populated rectangular matrices. So th these matrices are have full columns and full rows, and this is a lot of effort to learn them. And that's why it works only for very small examples. So, okay, what we should do, usually if you want to use it, for example, in image processing, where I'm also coming from, you must make your network convolutional. So, okay, so let's make our network convolutional. So this means that the matrices, the linear operators, which are involved in the network must be block circulant matrices with circulant blocks. And yeah, okay, let's have a look at these matrices now. Here you have a typical circulant matrix, and these are now the linear operators which should be involved. And of course, this is much better than learning the whole matrices because um, then you need not n, have not to learn n squared entries, but only the first row or the first column. And this is not so, this is of course less to learn. Okay. And we call such proximal neural networks, convolutional proximal neural networks, that when if these matrices which appear here, they can be rectangular, if these matrices here um, are from a Stiefel manifold. And now come, uh, comes a first theorem, which I think is a more general theorem. Whenever you have a matrix on a Stiefel manifold, and a second thing, namely that the matrix belongs to some matrix algebra. That means, uh, for example, it's not restricted to the circle and matrices. That means that you can multiply the matrices. It should be a commutative algebra. You can, can shift it and also the inverse exists. As it is really an algebra with the matrices form. Then you can show that such matrices from a matrix algebra and the intersection with the Stiefel manifold forms again a sub-manifold of the Stiefel manifold. And then this means in this case, we can use exactly the same um, learning strategy as before. We can learn on a Stiefel manifold with this restriction here that we need only the first row and this works in a very nice way. And this can be done also with other matrix algebras. You can, for example, in Italian, the tau algebra was very in for a while or in my with my colleagues in, in Como. Um, these are matrices which can be diagonalized, for example, by the cosine two transform or other transform. You know, circle and matrices can be diagonalized by the Fourier transform, but you can take other matrix algebras and it will work as well. So this is very good. So you can do the same thing with convolutional proximal neural networks. Hmm. But still, this is not enough. Even if these rows are fully populated in such a circle and matrix, you have still to learn too much. So usually you want that these rows here in your circle and matrices are sparse. That means that here this row or this uh, yeah, row is here, this is a column, that this column contains only a, a small number of entries. So let's have a look at this setting. So also we want now that we have sparse convolution filters. So for example, the, the, the rows in these block circle and matrices should contain many zeros and maybe at the beginning, some non-zeros and at the end, some non-zeros. So it has uh, more or less two L plus one entries. So, and then we form again, block circle and matrices with these, here's this L now with these sparse guys. So, and now we have an unfortunately, and the unfortunately is that the intersection between these circle and matrices and the Stiefel manifold are no longer on a manifold. This is very bad for learning. We cannot use the same thing as we did before. So, but what can we do? Okay, what we really want to learn is we want to minimize our loss function. And again, now we want to have the sparse convolutional matrices and Stiefel manifolds, okay? 
So, but we can, we were, at least we were not able to minimize this. Maybe uh, Giovanni or somebody can minimize this. We were not able <laughs> to do this. And that's why we relaxed the problem now. And instead of saying, okay, it has to be strictly on the Stiefel manifold, we said, okay, uh, let's, let, let's, let us penalize this constraint here and say, okay, they must not be really the identity matrix, but it should be near the identity matrix. And this can be the matrix itself or also the transpose here, yeah, because we have both directions. So, okay, then we can solve this and this, um, this can be done. And we also have that the algorithm converges somehow. But then finally, you came out with matrices TK, which are nearly orthogonal matrices. And then in a very final step, we really want that our Lipschitz constant is one. That's why in a final step, and maybe Johannes can say more about this, it really appears that these matrices are nearly orthogonal, but not completely orthogonal. So there is a final step where the, we make them orthogonal by projecting onto the Stiefel manifold. Okay, this is just in the final step, but the iterations are going here. So now we have these convolutional proximal neural networks, which can be also used for uh, for several things and also for, for example, for denoising. And indeed we tried how this works for denoising. So, okay. Let us use these proximal networks for denoising. So, and you see it's not only a proximal network, not a convolutional proximal network, it's a scaled proximal neural network. And why we need it scaled comes in a minute. First of all, how people learn noise or how learn uh, to denoise images, they don't learn the images, they learn the noise. So, and this is called so-called residual learning. That means if you have an image, which is noisy, and here is some noise, and say if in this talk, we take Gaussian noise with a certain um, cover, with a certain standard variation, uh, the standard deviation, so, okay. And then what, what we learn is now, we give this into our, our network. I will say something here. This is now our network. It's, it's our proximal network here. And then we find uh, the distance between this proximal network and the noise. Yeah, And what we give in here or what we uh, feed with our network is this, the RC noisy images. So this is just learn this epsilon, the noise and not the image itself. So, okay. Here are two different things. So far, my network was a phi, and this is now a psi. So, and we need for all these things a small trick, namely phi was the network I have explained to you with these proximal ingredients. And now we add at the beginning and at the end another matrix, which is just uh, you copy the input image M two times, and at, at the, finally you multiply with A transpose. And this guy here, this, this I call it psi, just with this A is again a proximal network, so still Lipschitz constant one. So now it is well known if you take such Lipschitz constant one and in particular some orthogonal matrices in the middle, then you have not a very good expressivity of your network. Also it's a loss in expressivity. But okay, we, we, we say, okay, we don't need really that it has Lipschitz constant one. We want that we can control the Lipschitz constant as it doesn't explode. So we learn not only this Lipsch not only our network psi, we learn in addition one, or we give in addition one parameter gamma. And this gamma is the Lipschitz constant we want to have because psi has Lipschitz constant one, gamma times psi has the Lipschitz constant gamma. If you say, okay, let's learn the network with gamma equal to two, three, five, then the expressivity becomes better. This is what we need for denoising. So, okay, so in summary, here is our network, which learns the noise, and then the, the image minus the noise is a good denoiser. So, and let's have a look what happens if we use this. And here's just one example in our paper are more, but you know these images, I think, a lot. This is just a neural network, which is learned for some noise level. I don't know why Johannes took it. It's 0 0.098 or so. This is a noise level. Also, it's learned for exactly one noise level. 
And then you can compare the network, for example, with uh, BM3D or also with other networks. And then you really see if you use Lipschitz constant one, you are in the area of BM3D. But if you increase the Lipschitz constant and we have really access what the Lipschitz constant is, yeah, then it becomes better and better here. And somewhere there appears a saturation here for some Lipschitz constant. And then you can, yeah, here it's already like an unconstrained CNN or DN CNN which appears in the literature. And the differences here are, yeah, I can zoom into this, look somehow, but I don't know what it says to me. So, okay, this is just PSNR. We can also take the similarity, structure similarity index, it's the same story. Good, okay, so it, it's very good. It's better than BM3D and yeah, we have the Lipschitz constant here. So, okay. Normally, you can learn you if also this is a network which which was learned for one noise level, yeah, and it is nice. So, but uh, usually you want if if what happens if you give other noise to the network? What appears? Can it also be good? And for this, we want to apply so-called plug and play techniques. So, in order to learn the network for one noise level, but the noise the image for different noise levels also. So, okay. And how these plug and play algorithms? They are, oh, I should give a citation here of different people, but it's in our paper. Sorry for this. Also, it's plug and play algorithms are very popular now, and it's uh, we haven't invented this. Um, uh, they work as follows. If you have some algorithm from convex analysis, this is here a forward backward splitting algorithm. And these algorithms, um, or if, if somebody comes from harmonic analysis, this is the same as the Easter algorithm. And the proximum in the Easter algorithm is just soft shrinkage. And for example, this forward backward shrinkage works as follows. First, you have here such a gradient step. You want to find the minimizer of F. No? First, you have of F plus G, I have to say. So, and then you take a gradient step in direction F, you apply the proximum with respect to G. And if you do this and do this and do this, and you choose eta in a correct way, this uh, parameter within the algorithm, then this converges to a minimizer of F plus G. Suppose that F plus G are um, proper convex LSC, as from our cone gamma zero. So, and, and of course, F must be differentiable. So, and now the idea in this plug and play algorithm is the following. They say, okay, this proximal step here, which you have in, in, in here in the second step, this is some kind as a denoiser. Think about soft shrinkage here, proximum one special for one special gain, namely the absolute value is the soft shrinkage. This is a denoiser. And then you replace this denoiser by any denoiser. So just D, any denoiser. It can be BM3D, whatever you want. So, and then you do the same without this proximum here, and this works fine. Yeah, it works fine in practice, but um, you cannot show too much about convergence. It works. And sometimes you can also find examples where it doesn't work. But in, in most examples, it's nice. You can find counter examples where such a simple thing doesn't work. So this can be done not only for this algorithm, for forward backward splitting. It can be done for many other primal dual algorithms, like, for example, the alternating direction method of minimizers. So, Good, and here is a general lemma. Um, it's, we, we proved it, it's not hard, but I, it must exist in the literature, it exists somehow there. Um, let If f, this function f is a convex function differentiable, it's uh, with an L Lipschitz gradient, and the denoiser, this guy here, must be averaged. It must be not a proximum, proximum is one half average, just averaged. Then you can choose this eta in such a way that uh, this forward backward proxy, also this um, plug and play algorithm converges. So it must not be a proximum, it's enough that it is an average operator. Yeah, so the idea is what we have is clear. Instead of this denoiser like BM3D, we cannot plug in our network, which is indeed an um, average operator, and can have a look if it works now. So. 
Good. Okay. So here is our denoiser. This is this D. You remember we this we learned it for the noise. Né? So the denoiser was this image minus noise. So this is our denoiser now. This was this psi. So and then we can show the following. If we have an oracle, just guess what the denoised image may be. And then we have our network here. Then we can show that this mapping here with this oracle here and this our denoiser here coming from our proximal neural network is again, this is averaged. And so the plug and play algorithm really converges. We can show convergence here. And numerically, we have seen that indeed in these networks here, in this denoiser here, that uh, the constant for this, um, it must be this for this phi, is indeed near to one half. Also, it's not really a proximum, but it's, yeah, it's near to one half. So if it is exactly one half, we don't need an oracle here. But yeah, okay, you can do some denoising with a very simple method, TV or whatever. Then you can use it as an oracle. You can just do this. And then you can plug this into a plug and play algorithm here and you have convergence guarantees. So, and if we do this now, then here is just an example. Um, this is now, we have learned again our network for a specific noise level. And then uh, we have trained the network, but um, we have trained it, I, oh, I don't know, I would say, okay. We have trained it and uh, it comes out that numerically, yeah, that it is an average operator, unfortunately not with t equal to one half, but with t equal to 0 0.6. So we need an oracle here. And um, yeah, and then we took already BM3D here. And then we can see that the network also works fine for other noise levels like 1.2, uh, 1.2 or 1, 0 0.215 or so. And here is again the PSNR of the noisy image. Here is the PSNR of our network with plug and play. Here is the variational networks, which comes from a paper of, oh, unfortunately, we cannot see the footnote but it's a paper of a POC at all, uh, a POC and co-writers, POC, Fland, and so on. And they have a network which has this PSNR here. You see it here, but we are, also, it's not a big step, but we can uh, really um, compete with these networks or so. And of course, this was our Oracle and it cannot be better than what we added to the Oracle. Yeah, but we can also go ahead with another Oracle and it will also work very well because we have this convergence guarantee. So, and here is just an example. You don't see too much. It's just the proof that we can have networks which where we have the Lipschitz constant in our hands and we can do denoising and several things with these networks. The, the bottleneck is that we have to uh, these uh, special algorithms. If we learn the network, it takes longer than a usual network because we have this orthogonality condition. Okay. So this was about proximal neural networks. So now let me come to the next part of my talk. Oh, I don't have a clock here. Uh, Philip, um, you, you, you may interrupt me. Uh? You, I you have know. 20 good minutes at least. Oh, okay. So because, okay. Good. Then let me come to, to the second part. Um, this is about invertible neural networks and it comes from sampling from the posterior distribution. These invertible neural networks are also known under the name normalizing flow. And there is there are several papers on different directions, how to invert a network. And there is a recent overview article of Haber and Laszlo Toto, Elad Haber and Laszlo Soto, an introduction to deep generative modeling. But I will not touch uh, guns here, generative adversary networks here. I do it in different ways. So, okay, the first part of my talk, just to get the relation to the previous part of my talk, is about residual networks. And this is really uh, research, um, ongoing research. I hope that we can finish this in the next months or so. This is a relation between invertible networks and our proximal neural networks. And this is just one page because this is um, research in progress. And then we'll, I wish. Then I will show you other networks which are not residual networks um, for solving inverse problems. So, okay, but let me first give one page why these proximal neural networks may be nice in connection with invertible networks. So, okay, what is a residual network first? A residual network has uh, layers. These are these different layers which you uh, 
concatenate in your network. And this is not just a network. The network has now the name G of um, theta k. Theta k is now are now the parameters, these matrices, and so on. And uh, you have not just the network, but you add to the network x itself in each layer. So, and these, as I said, these are sub-networks, and these are the so-called residual networks you have in many, many papers, in particular of last Rousseau, and they are related to PDEs and so on. This is a long story. What I'm interested in is if when these networks are invertible. That means if you have this result here, LK of X, which I call Y, can I go back to the X? So, and this is, uh, is work, for example, it appears in papers of Beermann and Shan. Also Beermann is also involved in the paper of Shan. And it's not hard to prove, it's just Banner's fixed point theorem, that this operator here is invertible, say LK of X is equal to Y, by a fixed point iteration. And what you have just to do is to take Y, the result here, and then you have to subtract the network again, and which, um, which the guy from the previous uh, iteration step. So, and it's not hard to show that this converges, not for every network, it converges if the Lipschitz constant of your network is smaller than one. So, and this was what this guy have shown, the network must be have Lipschitz constant smaller than one. So, because they want to use Banner's fixed point theory. So, and indeed, when they learn these networks, they want really to sample with these networks from posterior distributions. We also want to do this, but not on the slide. And then he, they have to make a big effort to ensure that they have really networks with Lipschitz constants smaller than one. Yeah, and this, this makes a lot of trouble here. So, okay, we have trouble <laughs> when learning our networks because we need orthogonal matrices, but then we have the Lipschitz constant in our head. So, and then we can really sure, or better Johannes has shown, uh, it's it's not hard if you understand the the life of these networks. If we have such a residual uh, such, such a network which is a t-average operators, and fortunately our networks are such t-average operators, then these networks are invertible. You don't need Lipschitz constant smaller one. An equal one is also fine because it's equal one. And then you need a little bit different iteration. And this iteration looks like this. And then it converges to the inverse. Yeah, then you can show this. So, OK, so this is now a really good starting point to use our proximal neural networks for such sampling problems or for sampling from the, pos from the posterior. And what it means to sample from the posterior, how we use it, I will not show with this residual networks because, as I said, it's work in progress. We, uh, I use it for direct invertible networks. So let's come to the next thing, namely to, again, to invertible neural networks in inverse problems. Same story. I don't want a neural network only. I want a neural network which I can invert. Okay, and how you do this is now a different way. I don't use residual networks now. I will do this directly now. Okay, so, and I want to use it for sampling from, say, param parameters from an inverse problem. I will explain it. So, okay, little switch to invertible networks, but not residual ones. Yeah, you can also use residual ones, but this is not the thing now. Okay. Good. We are in inverse problems now. So we are given a forward operator, and this forward operator is a bad operator. It has not full rank, or uh, it's not invertible, or not not uh, stable invertible, and so on, like a PDE or whatever you want. So you apply this operator, then usually noise comes into the play, and what what you get is this value y, and from y you want to go one you want to go back to x. So, and what we want is not that we have one y and we want to go to one x. We want to find the distribution of this um, of this x, yeah? So, okay. So, as uh, here's our forward operator. Then uh, in this talk, I assume that this, this eta, this noise is uh, normally distributed. And in our applications, I need, because this uh, y here is, um, is a long vector and uh, it has very different in, in, uh, components. I need that is, it, it is normally distributed with uh, some B and then a diagonal matrix where some W appears. So, and this means if I have a look now at this, if I consider this now, this Y here as an output of a random variable, capital Y, and uh, I consider the probability that um, of this, uh, well, the, the distribution of Y given, given that 
the random variable x here takes the value of x. This guy is then I should make a tilde here, not an equal. That this is normal distributed now, of course, with mean value f of x and with this um, variance here. So, okay, this is why, but we know why. Yeah? So this is not the interesting part. What we really want is we want the probability of x. See, so we want to sample from the distribution of x given y. Yeah, and in this talk, I only concentrate on the fact that really one y, one sample is given and uh, the, the probability or the uncertainty comes just from the noise. But meanwhile, we can do this also for many Ys here. But in this talk, I concentrate just on one value. So, and we want to sample from this um, posterior distributions. We want to find uh, where this X is coming from, or we want to know this density here. So, okay, and now the ansatz to do this in also in guns and in, in neural networks in general is that you don't, because you cannot sample from this distribution, you sample from a simpler distribution, which is uh, say with density PZ. And one thing what people always use is Gaussian distribution. So, okay, and then we define what we need now. This is a simple distribution, so it's simple to sample from a Gaussian. And what we need now is a diffeomorphism. And this depends also on a par parameter V. Later, this will be our network. And it goes from RD and RD. And I put here into brackets, this is something which goes from, um, yeah, from this distribution with Z to X. I wrote it in bracket because it's not correct. It goes from RD to RD, but it brings Z to X, yeah. So, and then we want to sample in the following way. We want that uh, the, uh, we want to find the, the T in such a way that it pushes the density PZ to our density or to our posterior density PX given, given Y. So, and uh, we want to, to do this in such a way that these, P, these, that these two density functions are very near to each other. So, and for this, I need a measure, which, or I need a distance between measures or better a distance here between density functions, a little bit simpler. It's not between measures, between density functions. So, and as a distance between density function, I took the kullberg leibner divergence. Yeah, of course, there are many experts in Genia and Wasserstein distances. You can also try this, but for this talk, I took two kullberg leibner distances. So, okay, what I want. This push forward operator means that I do the following. I take the T, also this here, this X, I bring it to the other side, T to the power of minus one. And then I take the, the simple density function P Z here. So, and this guy here, when I bring this back, should be very near to my posterior density, which I don't know and which I want to find. So, or where I want to sample from. Good, okay, so I have to bring this near to each other. So, and this is my loss function and I want to train my T in such a way that this loss function becomes very small. So how can I do this? Also I cannot do this by just looking into this expression and, and I, cannot, um, I cannot minimize this with respect to this theta, which is in this network T. So I have to rewrite this a little bit. So and I, indeed one can do this, also maybe first, um, okay, this is a loss function. Maybe first I have to say something about this guy T here, because T will be finally a neural network, but you see in my expression, there appears a T to the power of minus one. That means I need an invertible network. Yeah, And if I have this T, if I have learned it, then I can do the following. I sample as if I know T, then I can sample from the Gaussian distribution here. I can apply to each sample my network T and I got an X back and I can next sample, next X and so on. And then I have the distribution of this random variable X here, which um, where the noise comes also into the play. Good, okay, so let me say something about this T. As I have already mentioned, there exist different ways to make a network invertible. One was via this ResNet. So another possibility is to make it directly invertible. So, and this can be done by the following. The layers of this networks look like this. You have here some T's and these P's are again permutation matrices, nothing else. So. And these T's has a very special structure. 
And namely, it looks like this. You take this input here, you take uh, the exponential. This S is again a network. This is a normal feed forward network. And here again, another network. And these T's are also networks. Yeah. So, and then you can really invert this. And this has nothing to do with these networks, S and T here. It has just to do with the structure, with this e to the power of something. And you can write immediately down the inverse network. That means these are so called direct invertible networks. Networks, you have not to go via iterations. You can directly invert these guys. Yeah, you can write it down. Once you have learned this S, then you can write the forward and the and the inverse network. So, and this was um, not invented by us. These invertible networks. There was first a construction of invertible networks by Ding. He called us real NVPs. And this was a little bit simpler than this construction without an E function. It has somehow a tri-diagonal tri tri form without this T here. And this more advanced structures, which is a little bit more general and which we have used in our networks, goes back to a group of uh, Heidelberg around Arizona. And this is the same group here with Chen. So as a directly invertible. So, okay, and now, we can use this. Yeah, this is the operator T, which uh, we later use for our uh, a posterior sampling. So, and okay, now this is the thing we want to minimize here. And we have to rewrite this, yeah, in order to get access to what we minimize there. And one can rewrite this first, one can bring the push forward operator to the other side. And then one can really write this in such a way. This is equal to the expectation value with respect to the random variable set. Maybe it should be a large set here. And you take the, yeah, you take the, uh, this, is a, this is now the, this is not the post here, this is the prior distribution. No? This is P, Y given, given X. Here you have the prior on X, which you don't know, but for our uh, computations, we just assume that the X, this is some prior and you have to say something about it. And we say, okay, let's this be uniformly distributed. And what also appears in this, in this um, loss function is the logarithm of the, of the absolute value of the determinant of the gradient of our network. So this is something which appears here due to the transformation theorem of measures yeah so and we have to minimize over this so and now you can rewrite this again namely um this is here the uh, the yeah, prior distribution this nicht a posterior it's the opposite i show you what it is um okay this this we know this is um yeah okay okay yeah this is just here yeah this is just a normal distribution here this this distribution we know and we just plug this in, yeah, you have a log of A to the power because it is Gaussian and you get this expression. Y is known from set you can sample. This is just, um, this is uh, just um, your Gaussian and this is uniformly distributed by assumption and this is something you have to compute. So, and instead of the expectation value, you take just the empirical expectation value, you sample many, many sets here and set up the sum here. And then you have everything what you want. Now you can learn the, the parameter or the, of this T. Okay. There's only one thing which doesn't look so nice here to here to 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 build the as if you learn this you need the gradient with respect to the theta to the parameter, but here is this bad thing here that doesn't look so great. But fortunately for our special network, you can write down the gradient of this special network or of the parts of these networks, and they look like this here. It's not the gradient vanishes, and what survives is just these small networks which are in this special structure here and these permutation matrices. So the gradient looks fine. Still, you have to minimize this over the theta. Yeah, this survives because the theta is in S, S are networks. But nevertheless, here you have a gradient and then if you minimize it, you need another gradient of this with respect to theta. So you need only one gradient here because the first one is just this, it's simple, yeah? So now we can learn this and do many things. And so we did. 
And we have used this, uh, or the, the motivation was not only that we want to sample from some posterior, it came from a special physical problem. And this was a problem which we have tackled together with people from the Physikalisch Technische Bundesanstalt, which is next door to the building of the TU Berlin. And in particular, Sebastian Heidenreich and um, yeah, Andre Fakim Soltwich. So, okay, and this was um, inverse problems, which is called gracing incidence x-ray fluorescence or with these letters here and what people want to do is the following this is a, a, a problem which appears in ship design and these are very very small ships it's in the nanometer bereich in the nanometer uh, space and they want to have and um, these ships have several parameters here and they want to check if these parameters are fine. For example, the high this length and, and many other lengths. In, in, in summary, we have seven of these parameters. So our space, our X is not an image now. We are not in image processing now. It's just these seven parameters for this ship design. Yeah, And then they put some X-rays in on these ships. And what they get is such a fluorescence radiation here. And for X, for each angle in which this X-ray comes to the ship, you get a number which is called F of, um, of this depends, this X are the seven parameters and it depends on the angle. And they do it normally for 1078 angles. So our X as parameters of um, length seven, we are in R7 with our Y from this model, we are in R to the power of 178. This is the Y. Yeah, and normally in this, uh, in this computation, you have again some noise and this F here, how does well, how is it built? What is the forward problem to get this y? And the forward problem is a little bit hard. It uh, comes from the fraction tomography and the uh, diffraction of light. And light is normally diffracted by a so-called by the so-called Maxwell equation. And this Maxwell equation can be written in such a way. So this is the forward problem. And the parameters x are hidden in this mu and in this w here. Yeah, and in this epsilon also. So and then you you can get this A, this, this, um, this field here, this A, and from the A you have to build uh, the, not um, as a modulus and squared, and this gives you basically the F. This is very roughly explained, but this is a forward model, this small f, yeah? So, okay, this is what physically is going on if you are doing something, the physical model, or the, what mathematical mathematicians made out of the physical model, yeah? So, and then what, what they also made is that they can numerically treat this equation here. They can find this A, and this is really hard. This is a finite element um, implementation with special boundary conditions in order to solve this differential equation here to get the E and so on, and in order to model the forward operator. So, and what the next step now was to model this forward operator and to get from one from one set of parameters X, this A takes a long time, yeah? even if you do this numerically. And that's why they have learned a forward network, or we have learned a forward network for this, for the forward operator, just for this differential equation here. Yeah? This is now the small f, this is now a forward operator, and it just learned from this numerical measurements. They, they produced um, different parameters, 10 to the power of four parameters, different outputs of these curves, and then there, the forward operator was learned. And it this took some months to learn the forward operator. This is a long time now. But, but now we have the forward operator, yeah? Okay, and then now we have simple access and it works very good and it brings also the uh, physical things in a good way. Okay, okay. so. Uh, and what we did now, we uh, now tr uh, try to apply our inverse uh, neural networks to this problem. And first we generated synthetic examples now with this learn forward operator, and we did it for different noise levels. And I think I, I, to the best of my knowledge, but maybe you know better, this is the only paper which really uh, 
compares the outcome of such an inverse neural network with a very well established method in mathematics where research is going on for 50 years now, namely, namely with Monte Carlo, uh, with Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. They can also sample from posterior distributions. And so far, I don't know any paper who really compares these methods. So, but in our paper, we did. And here are the um, marginals for this uh, seven parameters, the distributions. And what comes out when we sample from a Gaussian and then we apply our network as we have learned. And uh, the blue results are, I think, these are of Markov, Monte, uh, so of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. The orange ones are ours. And you see if the noise is not too large, then these blue is the mean value here, then these values are near to each other. This is for a small degree of noise. And this is uh, through parameter y, and you see they are very near to each other. If the noise becomes larger, it deviates for some of these seven parameters, but it's still nice. And for more noise, okay, then it deviates more, but it's still a good result. So it's somehow, at least a numerical proof, that these inverse neural networks don't sample arbitrary from the posterior, but that they sample in a way where Monte Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo um, methods, um, there is co proof conversions and so on. Yeah, so this is really a good result. So then we can do it with real world experiments. That means with measurements of this functions f. And here is again a comparison between, um, yeah, between marginals of, um, of our inverse network and of Markov Monte Carlo change. And we have a final thing. Now we can, we have the, all these samples. Yeah, we can sample from the posterior. We can take the mean value of all the samples and then we can apply the forward operator. And then we may have a look how this forward operator differ, diff, deviates from uh, the measurements. And then you see that it's, it's, uh, it's a very good result that uh, if you apply the forward operator to the mean of our samples, it, it's really a good result for this forward network. So, okay, let me conclude. I have shown or I have introduced proximal convolutional neural networks. Sometimes we need them scalable to in, improve the expressivity of these networks. And we have then even with the scalable things, we have the Lipschitz constant in our hand. So we need higher training effort in all, since we are on this Stiefel manifold or a relaxation of this. And we can use this in connection with plug and play algorithms where we have certain convergence guarantees because we have this Lipschitz constant. So what is future work? As I have already shown you, we want to use it in, in, in these uh, REST nets, in these um, uh, REST neural residual neural networks, in inverse residual neural networks, where you really need the Lipschitz constant. Yeah? So, and this is, um, yeah, this is what we are doing currently. What we have already done is another thing. We have um, used um, direct, the these method I have shown you uh, on my last slide. This was just for one measurement y. But we can do this also for more measurements y by using another loss function, which includes the expectation value uh, over y. And we can also learn the noise level and other things. This is done, and I hope this will be finished by Paul this month. So, and then there is another topic which is extremely interesting with these invertible neural networks, namely, if you want to sample from a unimodal Gaussian, it is not possible if your, um, if your probability that, um, if your posterior probability is multi-marginal, it's not possible that you can that you can get this multi-marginal distribution by sampling from unimarginal distributions without a network where the, um, where the Lipschitz constant explodes. Yeah? Also if you want to sample from such a distribution and want to get such a distribution here, this is not possible. They will, there will be points between them. Yeah? So, and one way out was shown by Sebastian Neumeyer and Paul that you can sample, for example, in a special way, not from a, from a simple Gaussian, but from, from a mixture model of a Gaussian. And another point would be that the thing is that you cannot use a network here with, with has a bounded Lipschitz constant. It's not possible. The Lipschitz constant from here to this multi module explodes. So, but of course you can let it explode if you want. And then you can try to sample from this. And currently we are also studying these multi marginal distributions a little bit better and how we can go from say this uni from such a distribution to such a distribution but this is also related with this first point on invertible resonance now so okay 
So it was long enough, I think. I thank you very, very much for your attention. And here are some papers. One has started in harmonic analysis and here's the one in inverse problems, but the other ones are, or these two ones are still under review. And yeah, thank you very much. Maybe I see you, Gabi. Uh, Thanks a lot. I just knocked down my glass with water. It's now on my <laughs> on my on my desk. <laughs> I have so, a swimming swimming a swimming laptop now. <laughs> thank you very much for your very nice talk. And uh, are there questions or remarks from the audience on particular points? Hi, Gabi. So I I have a question on the on the first part. Uh, well, actually, two questions. One is. Um, so can you say something on the on the operator norm of the maps t in these networks i mean wouldn't I mean, wouldn't it be simpler to just require the operator norm of these maps t to be less than one without all the structure of these proximal networks yeah but then you have to ensure this that it is less than one somehow in your training yeah. process you can do this yeah but okay yeah and, and this is also what the others did uh, as you try in these invertible networks you you they really have to take care for that the that but then you need it for the world that the whole network has an uh, uh, ellipsis constant smaller than one no? but mm. as i said sometimes you do this is not good with this Lipschitz constant because the expressivity is not so good i see but i mean with your choices requiring that t and T transpose gives you give, gives you the identity. Does this imply that actually actually the operator norm of this T is less than one or not? It's equal to one. It's equal to one. So so yeah, I still miss the point. Since at the end we need to we need a deep sheet constant constant less than one. That's our final objective. What's the point of adding all the complicated construction of proximal neural network? Why can't we, for example, why do we need to add the T2 transpose on top of on top of the classical network? Why do we have to do it? I mean, if at the end of the day, still the, mm, the simplest uh, constraint would still give us a, a, a one Lipschitz network. Yeah, you need still an operator which has operator norm one, and this is in the Stiefel manifold. And and maybe this this construction with this proximum, it 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 just came from. Also, if you multiply them and multiply them, then you know, for example, if you have these all these guys, okay, the Lipschitz constant is smaller than one, but for plug and play, you need a little bit more. You need somehow this t in this operation. Yeah, if, if you have a look at these constructions, you need somehow this T. You can say, okay, it's it's uh, it's it's averaged and it has constant smaller than one. This is okay, but you need a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You need to define this T somehow. On the T was zero point six, for example, and then you can use this. I see. But and of course, you, um, you can. Um, you uh, the, the main point is is that the operator norm is smaller than one. But you have to ensure this somehow, and we do this by just uh, mani uh, minimizing on a Schiefel manifold. Mm -hmm. And we have to make it convolutional. No? This is also yeah. you need I to understand. ensure this somehow. Yeah, and can you give us an intuition of why you don't get a manifold if you have like sparse yeah. localized kernels with the convolution? That was my question too. Yeah, you, you, you can give a, in our papers a simple example that you don't stay on, on the manifold. Also, you, you stay here if you have, yeah. But the, my question would have been, I mean, since I'm building on Giovanni's question, how far are you from being on, on a manifold? I mean, is there, because then you project. So, right? It, it, I think at some point you showed that since you don't have a manifold, then in order to optim to to make your algorithm work, you, then you have to project onto a manifold. Finally, finally, at the end, at the very end, and in the so, middle uh, of the is, steps, is we a... really need this regularizer. And uh, maybe Johannes can correct me as far as I, um, I, I as I remember, we have, if we don't have this regularizer, we are far away from orthogonal matrices. matrices. Okay. Thank you. But of so, course, Giovanni, you can you really think about operators with operator norm one, but it makes things not easier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
And as I said, this, this, this construction with the proximal operator uh, mainly came from, um, mainly came from, uh, we come from convex analysis. Yeah, 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 yeah. and we came from Galen's paper with this soft shrinkage. I, am, I, am I understand the particular structure, my, my, but I, yeah, yeah, fair enough, I understand. And can you do injective, like invertible networks with convolutions as well? This is like, with convolutions. Also, this is, also these invertible networks are, yes. they have this special structure. You have this, was ich, A to the power of something. And to yeah. the power of something is to the power of a network. And in this network, you could use, uh, con of course, these are convolutional networks. I see, but the, okay, and and what and and this this e to the something does it kill the structure? I mean, what, what does it do in in geomet in, in geometric terms? Okay, there are two two things. Okay, these these invertible networks where I have spoken in the last part of my talk, they have nothing to do with proximal networks. Absolutely mm. nothing. You yeah. just just took SS and ST as these small networks. You can took any you can take any network, whatever yeah. you want. Yeah. Um, the other network, these REST nets, this has to do with our proximal networks because in the REST nets, we don't have the special structure. You cannot directly invert them and you need this X plus and then uh, network T of X. And this T is then uh, a proximal network. And then you don't have to take care for the Lipschitz constant if you have it within the network. I, I don't know if this is better or something like this. It works. And uh, we have the bottleneck. We learn it directly. And the other ones have a step which ensures in many tricks. And these tricks ensure that the Lipschitz constant is smaller than one. This was your question. You can ensure it in another way. Not mm -hmm. as we did it, but in another way. And what we like was the structure which is coming from convex analysis and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. But this last part of my talk has nothing to do with proximal networks. This no, is I just, yeah. no, yeah, this is just, and this is interesting because this multi-model, uni-model that you really can prove that the Lipschitz concept explores, these are really nice theoretical results also. Are there other questions from, from the audience or comments? I don't see anyone, so. Let's thank again Gabi for the nice, very nice talk. And uh, hopefully Gabi will meet in person in the not too distant future. I hope Actually. so. 